Blake Fitzpatrick and Bob Del Tredici, or Bob Del Tredici and Blake Fitzpatrick, I can't remember how it is on the program. They have been a, involved in one another's work uh, in a symbiotic way for a number of years, but Bob got there first. He has written, he has taught, he has photographed, he has interviewed, um, he has been a major disturber in the fields of the bomb uh, since the late 70s when he started working on Three Mile Island and then subsequently on the nuclear state and the industries of the nuclear following that. Um, and his contributions have been, um, uh, they have been consistent and in my view immeasurable. Um, Blake Fitzpatrick wrote a brilliant dissertation on things nuclear, particularly a nuclear representation in photography. Um, as a photographer himself, as an artist himself, he's a writer photographer, so although he has a doctorate, and that would seem to put uh, the logics of writing first, it's not, it's a constant relationship that moves back and forth, so in some sense his work is parallel to Bob's. Uh, they have collaborated on exhibitions, they have uh, collaborated on projects, they are collaborating again today, and uh, I would like to welcome you both. Uh, well, thank you, um, John and, and, and Colette, and welcome everybody, and good morning. Um, uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity for us to speak together. Uh, Bob and I have been working um, separately in Port Hope, the topic of our conversation today, uh, and it's just a, it's a wonderful opportunity to have a chance to work together on this. And so thank you to both John and, and, and Claudette and the team here for inviting us and for hosting this uh, really great uh, event. So our talk today is about Port Hope, Ontario, a company town that has been living with radioactive materials for approximately 80 years. Bob and I will draw from our photographic work to provide a visual context for this little known big story in Canadian nuclear history. The town of Port Hope is located on the shores of Lake Ontario, about 100 kilometers east of Toronto. It is Canada's premier atomic town and the nation's conduit into the nuclear world. The radioactive history of this town is one of dramatic and traumatic disclosures and silences, protests and inertia, that is now culminating in a nuclear cleanup of unprecedented magnitude. At a cost of $1.28 billion, the pending cleanup is certain to change this area forever as some 125,000 truckloads of low-level radioactive waste are to be dug up and relocated to large-scale storage mounds in Port Hope and nearby Port Granby. The, beyond providing a chronology and a map of the present waste locations, we want, to, we want to reveal how a once invisible secret suddenly comes into view as the identity of the town that once radiated friendliness is redefined by the massive nuclear dump it is now creating. Well, to take nothing for granted, let's just say that it all starts with the element of uranium, the heaviest naturally occurring element on the planet, man-made, not man-made, naturally occurring. And it's such an unusual substance, there is nothing else like it from our planet. It is so uh, singular in its properties that uh, I think one very good way to describe it is as a shape-shifter. This, by the way, is a model of the uranium atom in downtown Elliott Lake, uh, the site of many mines, uranium mines, that contributed everything they had to the Manhattan Project for the first 20 years of their operation. And so there are many tailings ponds and uh, uh, abandoned mines there. And the town is called by the Chamber of Commerce there, Elliott Lake, the jewel in the wilderness. As a shape-shifting element, uh, there are three different ways that, that uranium acts that are unique. One of them is its natural radioactivity. It is an unstable element. It's very heavy, and it's constantly throwing off 
particles of itself. And when that happens, uh, the atom that does that becomes a different element. This is uh, completely predictable. You cannot speed it up or slow it down. Uh, it's an amazing uh, continuous transformation where uh, uranium uh, turns into any one of these elements uh, in order, thorium, protactinium, uranium, 234, thorium, radium, radon, 222, polonium, lead, bismuth, and polonium again. Uh, these things have a half-life of anywhere from a fraction of a second to 70,000 years. That's what we mean when we say uranium is radioactive. But there's a second shape-shifting quality to this element, and that is that it can be split apart. If you fire neutrons at it, it will break up the atom. And this is a monument to the fissioned atom in the city of Chelyabinsk, closed until the uh, Soviet Union dissolved, and then it was open to uh, activists who felt like they would like to see this city. Uh, there's Igor Kurchatov in the front, the father of the uranium uh, fissioning process for the bomb in the Soviet Union. And on this great monument, we see a very simple thing, a one atom in the form of two hemispheres. It's being pulled apart, and the curves around it represent the waves of energy given off when you split an atom. So the trillions upon trillions of atoms split at virtually the same time equals the energy of an atomic bomb. The other interesting thing about this is that we are looking at the process by which fallout is formed. Fallout is made up of the broken pieces of the atoms, and they don't always break 50-50. They can break in, in uh, myriad different combinations, each one of which is its own element with its own half-life. Now, the third shape-shifting quality of uranium, it's naturally radioactive, it can be split apart, and it can absorb neutrons. So that's how plutonium is created. You fire a neutron at U-238, it absorbs it, and becomes plutonium-239. So that plutonium is the result of uranium absorbing a neutron. So those three qualities make this a, a, an amazing element and the mother of all nuclear technologies. It all begins here in Port Radium Mine, uh, just beneath the Arctic Circle on the far edge of Great Bear Lake, a body of water so big you can see it from the moon. This is um, Joe Blondin Jr., one of the Dene natives, who was hired uh, from the little settlement of Delaney, the only settlement in this whole vast northern region. Uh, he and his um, fellow workers and men from Delaney would carry uh, the uranium ore onto the barge that would go across Great Bear Lake. I love this m point in the mine because there on the ground were these burlap sacks rotting in the sun, and those sacks tell the story, namely that the ore carriers uh, carried the ore, uh, crushed, finely uh, broken down, in burlap sacks. And the sacks were soft, uh, the, the boat trip was at least 14 hours, and they slept on the sacks. And the sacks emitted all sorts of dust particles. In time, the town of Delaney became known as the village of widows. So, tracing uh, the journey of uranium. It goes into a mill. This is the Key Lake Mill, northern Saskatchewan, where the uranium is refined into a substance uh, known as yellow cake. Then from there, from the mill, the yellow cake is sent to the Blind River uranium refinery. And when it's uh, just about ready uh, to be uh, exit the plant, it's known as okay liquor in a liquid form here, and it's dry, dried out. And from Blind River, it goes to the Port Hope uranium conversion facility. Port Hope was early, in the early days, uh, a refinery, but then when Blind River came online, it became known as a conversion facility because it converted uh, yellow cake into two different substances. Here we see the lagoon in front of the Port Hope uranium facility, people fishing. 
don't look too happy about it. Um, in that lagoon, there are many, many hundreds of tons of waste from the early days of the radium uh, refining, which is the origin of the Port Hope facility. It's the first radium slash uranium refinery in the world. So it's therefore one of the oldest and one of the largest. So in the bottom of that lagoon is a lot of waste, historic waste, and people fish and eat the fish from the lagoon. We see two buildings here. Uh, the one on the far left is the, uh, uh, the building that transforms yellow cake into uranium dioxide and uranium trioxide. Those are the two products of that building. And one of them is for fuel for Kandu reactors, which uses unenriched uranium. And the other, uranium trioxide, is then sent to this facility, the UF6 facility, which converts uranium trioxide into uranium hexafluoride, which is the component that is sent worldwide uh, to be enriched for, um, for fuel in light water reactors. And, and it can also be enriched even higher for the bomb. Uh, let's take a little closer look at that building. The shot was taken around Christmas time, so uh, they're, they're sending people their best wishes for the season. Um, that has a HEPA filter on it to protect people from the things that would otherwise spew out. HEPA filter, H-E-P-A, stands for High Efficiency Particulate Arresting. You're under arrest, you particulate. And people will tell you that HEPA filters are very good. They're the best filters that they have. They are 99.99999 efficient. And as Alice Stewart pointed out to me once, she said, it's the last digit that you have to pay attention to, the one that comes after all the nines. Because those particles are too small that no filter can trap them. They are, they're the tiny, minuscule, uh, mini, there must be even nano type classification for these particles. They don't get stopped by the HEPA filter. They go out, and when those particles are inhaled, because they're so small, they can travel anywhere in the bloodstream. They can cross the blood-brain barrier. They can go anywhere in the body that, uh, that will carry them. So they're exceedingly dangerous. Uh, so to live in a place that refines uranium like this, uh, that's the problem. Now, the facility itself has admitted that it releases every year 120 kilograms of uranium into the air. That's the company's own admission. So the chances are it might be more. Half of those emissions are referred to as fugitive emissions, which means they don't know where they're coming from. They, all they know is that more uranium is getting out than comes through the stacks and from some place that they haven't yet tracked. Now here's what the officials from the chemical plant say about these emissions. Even though emissions from the Port Hope conversion facility are a fraction of the regulatory limits, which actually are very, very high. Um, Cameco is committed to continual environmental improvement and continual reduction of emissions, consistent with the priorities members of the community have told us are most important to them. I love the way it just kind of trails off. Uh, you got priorities that are important. We are committed to dealing with those priorities. They could be saying they're committed to preventing diseases happening from exposure to uranium, but they're committed to priorities that are important to people. So here's a picture of, uran of uh, radiation, which is said to be invisible. But in this case, this is an autoradiograph of a particle of plutonium in the lung tissue of an ape. It's an alpha emitter, plutonium is, like uranium. So that means that the radiation doesn't travel far, but the particles that uh, alpha uh, make up alpha radiation are very powerful, like a bull in a china shop. So the 10,000 cells within the spiky radius are receiving a heavy dose. So the problem is inhaling it or getting it into your system through a bruise or a cut. Uh, if you don't do that, then you're okay. But if you do do that, then you have a source of radiation that will uh, stay with you for a very long time. 
This is Dr. Carl Z. Morgan, the father of health physics. And he was hired during the Manhattan Project. Uh, the government said, Carl, you're a cosmic ray uh, uh, physicist. We want you to become the head of health physics. Carl told me he reached for his hat and made for the door because on his way out he said, I never even heard of health physics. And they grabbed him and said, well, it's okay, Carl, we haven't heard of it either. We just made it up. But we need somebody to monitor the amount of radiation that workers can be exposed to who are going to be making the bomb. They're going to be handling a lot of radioactive elements. So Carl Morgan accepted and for 28 years was the head of health physics at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, early on, he did a lot of studies, animal studies. He did a lot of reading. And he came to the conclusion there is no safe limit, no safe level to radiation. Even low doses of radiation can cause damage. Alice Stewart would agree with him on this. They said, Carl, we need a number. That's not good enough. Give us a number. He said, OK, five rems a year. But don't even come close to that. And that became the industry standard. So um, this is a view of Port Hope. I've was raised a Catholic, so when I see a cross, I respond to it. Um, this is uh, on uh, Alexander Street, right opposite the Port Hope facility. So I will hand this over to Blake, and in my next series of slides, we will look at the people and the places of Port Hope. So carry on with the cross here. Um, we're now at St. Mary's School, 1975 where high levels of radon gas, 21 times higher than allowable in Ontario, were discovered in the gym and in the ground floor of the cafeteria. Uh, the school was shut down for two years, and like other, other buildings in town, radioactive fill from the El Dorado nuclear refinery had been used in its construction. As the heat of the national media focused in on Port Hope, the evacuated school in particular, and Port Hope in general, became infamous as one of Canada's first radioactively contaminated communities. So this is Little Port Hope in Chalk, uh, in Chalk River. And uh, in the fall of 1976, more than 100,000 tons of radioactive material from Port Hope was trucked to Chalk River and dumped into a small valley. Three years and about 2,500 truckloads later, uh, that small valley became a contaminated field, and the operation was terminated. Uh, this is all about getting the waste out of Port Hope, which has been a, a long-standing uh, question and problem. One answer to the problem was they established a siting task force, which was to find a permanent site for the Port Hope waste. It offered financial incentives uh, to any community that would take the waste, but after three years, not one Ontario community came forward, and the task force was disbanded. So it was back to square one with the waste, and in 1998, proposals for a long-term radioactive waste storage facility were developed by Port Hope and by neighboring Port Granby. Uh, this is a map that shows the present locations of large-scale, low-level radioactive waste deposits in Port Hope. The waste have been mapped, monitored, and have remained in situ for decades. Uh, one example here is a, this is a view of the uh, Cameco plant from Alexander Street. Um, uh, at this, this is right across the road from houses. I can show you here, for example, the, the sort of overview diagram. So where we were was just on, on the road where that red car is. Uh, at the end of that street is a ravine, Alexander Street ravine. Inside of that circle is a pocket of radioactive material that is going to have to be dug out. And I just point out the proximity of that material to the residential houses. This is another area of known contamination, the CNCP viaduct area. Uh, it's a, it includes this area where these two boys are sitting and also the space between those two tracks. Um, in this case, uh, one of the boys has on his t-shirt the word hot, which obviously is open to numerous interpretations. Um, here's another place in Port Hope, the Pine Street Consolidation Site, um, where um, this is one of, this is a, a temporary storage area for radioactive waste that has been dug up and consolidated behind the fence. Uh, after the discovery of radon gas at St. Mary's School, radiation surveys were conducted on some 4,000 commercial and residential properties in Port Hope, and approximately 800 sites were identified as requiring further testing 
and eight major areas, including the Pine Street Extension, were identified as problem areas. And that's where this uh, radioactive uh, ribbon was found. Similarly, Brewery Pond, uh, this is a disjointed panorama uh, that includes engineering studies for draining the pond and removing the radioactive waste that had been thrown in and dumped and was sitting on the bottom of the pond. That had to be dredged out and then the pond refilled. And so this, this Im image here is um, after that, after the cleanup was complete. The amazing thing is that Port Hope is a place where the subsurface composition of the landscape comes very close to full intelligibility. When we're there, we see just fields and, and you know, ordinary looking streets, but everything we're seeing is mapped and known and, and, and has been studied. One of the ways in which it was studied is by way of monitoring radon. Um, sometime during 1992-93, I began to notice a disproportionate number of birdhouses across the fields of Port Hope. Upon cl closer inspection, I realized that the black circle on the box had been painted on. The Office of Low-Level Radioactive Waste Management had some 50 detectors in the field for mapping radon arising from the ground throughout Port Hope. I photographed over a dozen of, the, of them. Hiding the radon detector inside a birdhouse is not only a useful way to protect the devices from vandals, but it's also an effective form of terror management. Radioactivity doesn't just have to be technologically monitored, it also has to be culturally managed. Exposing the detector, or at least making of it an explicit presence, I decided to build my own replicas of these birdhouses and to place them in prominent locations throughout the town. I put a felt marker inside each birdhouse and asked people to comment on the nuclear waste in their community, and I posed a question for them to at least start with. The results ran the gamut from thoughtful statements about the environment and civic responsibility to goofy one-liners marked by jokes and violence and, for example, in, in one, the smoking area of the Port Hope High School where I put one, uh, when I went to retrieve the box, it was just on the ground in pieces, which I suppose is its own comment. Um, I want to take you into a house that's quite famous in Port Hope. Um, it was the home of Marcel Pochon, who was the chief chemist at El Dorado. He lived in this beautiful older home on Dorset Street, which is one of the more prominent uh, streets in the town. Pochon had studied with Pierre Curie, husband to Marie, Madame Curie, in Paris, and came to Canada in 1931 to set up the radium processing operation at El Dorado. A sign ha ha hangs over the front door of the home, which reads Weedar, which spells the word radium backwards. Pochon died in 1958 of lung cancer. He was in his 70s and had been a heavy smoker. His daughter, Anita, was the last remaining family member to live in the home, and she died in the early 1990s. So this is um, uh, a, a sort of a, a trip through uh, Weedar or the House of Radium. Uh, in 1992, the house was being readied for sale, and it was radioactively contaminated. It was likely that Marcel Pochon had inadvertently carried radioactive dust home with him and that this material was deposited on the objects he touched within the home. The bathtub and drain system out to the street were removed because, of course, he would be bathing in the evening and, and materials from his body were washed down into the drain. Bricks on the exterior house were radioactively contaminated and so also were removed. Floorboards um, were taken up. The hardwood floor was taken up because radioactive dust had settled between the cracks of the floor, exposing the subfloor. Um, and when they discovered radioactive material, they would put a red sticker on that object and record uh, an inventory, you know, counts per minute in, 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 a, in, a, in a journal. In this particular case, by the way, the, the, some of the objects are not really uh, because of the touching uh, or brought, I don't think it's the result of radioactive contamination brought into the house. For example, that, that West Clocks was a clock painted with luminous radium paint on the dials and the hands, so it's radioactive um, as it came into the house in the first place. But even, um, you know, common things, kids' toys, books, records, uh, cups, saucers, everything one could imagine in anyone's home uh, were contaminated. And so we see here, for example, a little red dot on the nose of that toy dog next to a Geiger counter. I, I actually, you know, the floor started to resemble something like a measled landscape with red dots everywhere. And really, I think the problem tends to be one of thumbs, because it, if you pick up a frame or a, an image, a, a photograph, um, your hand, your thumb would be sort of holding the front 
uh, front of it at the corner. It seems to be that's where all the kind of marking takes place. This, by the way, is a, a photograph of his son, Max, Marcel Pochon's son, Max, and that's Marcel Pochon in the inset photograph with his hands in his pocket. And this is a slipper um, I located uh, some time later that belonged to Marcel Pochon. One of the members of the staff had, who had done the cleanup in the house took the slipper with him and was using it, um, as he was now retired, and he was using it to give talks about radioactivity to local high schools in Ottawa. And he would bring this out with his Geiger counter and read the bottom of the slipper, which was contaminated from walking the floors of Muidar. Whoops. Um, a lot of those objects are now in the radioactive, uh, the uh, low-level radioactive waste management office in Port Hope. And um, there's a, um, an inventory of contaminated objects, some of the things that came out of the Pochon home, but also out of other homes throughout the town. And one of the interesting objects is a radioactive, um, radioactively contaminated artifact, uh, autograph album. Marcel Pochon um, was believed to have been an avid collector of movie star portraits. The pages of the albums are contaminated, but the photographs were not. The photographs have thus been removed from the album and given back to the family. Name tags identify the movie stars who once graced these pages. The album is included in the inventory of contaminated artifacts now housed in the low-level radioactive waste management office. A series of circular connections actually plays out in this album. Greer Garson played Madame Curie, Marie Curie, and Walter Pidgeon played Pierre Curie in the 1943 MGM studio film Madame Curie. Marcel Pochon studied with Pierre Curie and was trained by these nuclear pioneers. Pochon's connection to the discovery of radioactivity through the Curies and their subsequent representation in the film is made compellingly real by the radioactivity that binds these absent subjects through the pages of the album. I started Googling uh, the names of actors in this album only to realize that both Van Johnson and Robert Walker were also in the film Madame Curie. So what I first thought was a one-off connection to the film turns out to be something more. Madame Curie and the discovery of radioactivity is both literally and figuratively all over this album. Jennifer Jones did not appear in Madame Curie. However, she was married to Robert Walker, who did. And the postcard she sent in 1945 to Anita Pochon, the daughter of Marcel Pochon, is now and will forever be radioactive. The referential change that binds photography and radioactivity runs throughout the album, originating beyond the frame in the El Dorado refinery and the, and the work, the life, and it turns out the touch of Marcel Pochon. Before I shot these objects, I was warned that my backdrop, my photographic backdrop, would need to be left behind as a contaminated ar artifact at the end of the photographic session. This demonstrates the insidious, uncontainable nature of radioactive materials. The, the container becomes the contained, and the background becomes the foreground when radioactive materials are handled. Bob. I call that the King Midas effect, a reverse King Midas, that everything radioactive elements touch become Radioactive. We're now going to look at the people and the places of Port Hope, a little tour of uh, Canada's uh, prettiest heritage site and the site that is the most unbuffered in the nuclear world. Because when they built that refinery in 1932, the notion of a buffer for protection did not yet exist, and the site is still there. Could not have been rebuilt today, but there it stands. So there's the Cameco Lagoon with Canada geese. I had to run and shout and clap my hands to get them to fly so I could have a nice shot. But the point is that there are fish in the lagoon. There are boats. It's a, it's a site for the Port Hope Yacht Club. There are birds. And everything's all together here, the uranium, the facility, and nature itself. It's all uh, in one continuous loop. So let's take a look at some of the people of Port Hope. This is on a Canada Day, July 1st, um, about uh, six years ago. I, I don't photograph parades, but I love photographing people getting ready for parades. And so this is the side street where these um, beautiful women in belly dancing, angelic costumes were getting ready. And I said, uh, 
I'd love to take your picture. Could we also include your son who is sitting on the sideline because I saw he had the mark of Cain on his chest. Uh, so everybody said fine and I took the picture. So for me, this is a, an image of denial. People are, for the most part, perfectly happy to be living in Port Hope, a, a company town, and uh, believing that what the company tells them that there is nothing whatsoever to worry about. But let, let's say that you, you know that uh, uranium emissions are dangerous, um, but they're invisible and they take a long time, a latency period to manifest. How do you photograph something like that? That, that was my challenge. So, um, oh, this notion, by the way, of denial um, goes way back to the very first uh, days of the nuclear age. This is a Operation Crossroads hearing, 1985 Operation Crossroads being the first atomic test after the Nagasaki bomb. It happened in the same year, so they'd lost no time uh, setting off uh, bombs. In this, these were in the Marshall Islands, two explosions, Abel and Baker. And these hearings are being held because 40 years later, um, there are certain problems cropping up among the atomic veterans who were forced to witness these explosions at cl close range. But the General Pickett there is giving testimony. It's the same line that they used immediately after the explosions, namely that the exposures were so minimal that there would be no after effects whatsoever, nothing to worry about. He's still saying that, except that 40 years later, uh, the veterans are dying of radiation-related illnesses. You cannot prove it, but after a while, uh, it becomes evident that something uh, unnatural is going on. So denial is a constant element in anything to do with radiation. So I <coughs> excuse me, came to the conclusion the way to photograph it is through metaphors. So here's a sign at the welcome dump. It's a radioactive dump where Port Hope put its most, um, its early wastes. So to me this says, welcome dump, keep out. And I liked how the sign was disintegrating. For me this was an image of um, slowly evolving damage due to radiation. This is not a metaphor. Every once in a while you hit the real thing. This is up at the Port Radium mine, and we have two Dene workers holding up a sign from the De Canada Department of Mines, written in 1931, which warns the people handling the samples from the Port Radium mine that uh, they could be dangerous to their health. These are radium samples, but they're very similar to uranium samples. You see, in 1931, they knew that the ingestion of small amounts of radioactive dust over a long period of time will cause a buildup of material in the body which may have serious consequences, lung cancer, bone necrosis, rapid anemia. They knew in 1931. But this was for the workers in Ottawa who were handling the samples. They did not convey the same information to the Dene ore carriers. So here's another metaphor. Let's say you're wandering around Port Hope, feeling the invisible radiation in the air, wondering how to photograph it, and you catch out of the corner of your eye the sun glinting in a puddle opposite the plant. So there, there's a picture of radioactive water, maybe. But every once in a while, you get to go beyond metaphor. Here's the broken pipe discovered in 2008 by someone flying over Lake Ontario who saw it. This is after the thaw, and the ice had sheared off this plastic pipe and made it uh, butt out into the air, and it was uh, sending liquid into the lake. Turns out this pipe went 2.5 kilometers uphill to the welcome dump site, and it was draining off radioactive and toxic materials into the lake, and it had been doing that for 50 years, and nobody knew about it until this broken pipe appeared. 
Haskell, Sanford Haskell, um, paid for the pipe to be analyzed for the, for the liquid coming out of it. And he found that there were 50 times a normal limit of, radi of uranium and five times as much arsenic coming out of that pipe. It turns out that there is no limit for the amount of uranium that is, is allowed to be reduced, to be re released into Lake Ontario. No limit. You can release as much as you want. And that the arsenic limits are 100 times higher than the limits for arsenic in other parts of the world. So Sanford is not happy with that. Here's Mill Street, stone's throw from the UF6 building, and uh, right uh, around the corner from the Rainbow Cafe and restaurant. And this man is heading to the East Beach, a lovely vacation spot for people in the area. Known to be contaminated, but no postings are made, no measurements are taken, but it's so close to the site that it's, it's, it's um, got to be the recipient of a lot of fallout. And so when I saw this shot, to me this is like pornography of, of uh, radioactive materials interacting with the human body. It's still speculative on my part, it's still a metaphor, but down the street, it's no metaphor to see this uh, house undergoing soil remediation. It's, it's about the equidistant uh, to the plant as the beach is. So the soil all throughout this area is over the decades has been contaminated. And here's a demonstration project where they're digging up the soil and removing it and replacing it in order to remediate the site. In 2010, Helen Caldecott blew into town. And she came uh, to speak about radiation in Port Hope, and she came with three headline statements. The first one was, the entire town of Port Hope should be evacuated. The second statement was that the plant should be completely shut down. The third statement was that they should sue the government for damages. So three impossible demands that people could not act on. They made the headlines, but I was disappointed because I thought what she also could have done is said, here's $200,000, go and do these health studies. Because all the health studies that are done are co-opted or denied by Port Hope, and there are plenty of health anomalies in the town. But she could have helped create some kind of system for doing a citizen-based health study, but it never even came up. So at that meeting in the Best Western Hotel, wrap it up. All right, I can wrap it up. It's Molly Lawson, the daughter of Pat Lawson, telling about her brain tumor and being very angry about it. This is Tom Lawson, um, a, a long-term activist, and his wife, uh, Pat Lawson, who's lived in Port Hope for four, since the age of four years old, an unflagging activist. This is John Rainbird, who died about uh, a week ago. He had bone cancer and lung cancer. He'd worked at the plant for 12 years. This is Dan Rudka who had been exposed to radioactive dust while working at Zirkatech and had just recently had a, a double lung transplant, a very rare operation, and he survived, and he's doing rather well. And here's Farley Mowat, a resident of Port Hope, and when I asked him, what do you think, Farley, about the, the big refinery down the road, he said it's proof positive of man's folly. He said, I've given up on humanity. I'm paying attention to animals because they really need our help. Final two slides. Nuclear seeing. We've heard about looking through rose-tinted glasses or looking through a glass darkly, but what about looking through radioactive lenses? Because that's what's happening with the industry. The lenses affect their brains. The industry began by the creation of the bomb. It has limitless money and uh, the length of the materials lasts virtually forever. So it clouds the ability of people wearing those lenses to deal with reality. 
Here's another shot on Canada Day. I call this a uranium-238 atom, and it's alpha particle. <laughs> and then almost the final shot, a, the, a window in Port Hope. If you're waiting for a sign, this is it. Uh, in other words, we're going to do this, okay? You don't have to like it or anything, but this is it. This is what you get. You get this 500-year uh, waste site. Final image. This is Matthew Kuncom, Grand Chief of the Cree Nation, totally opposed to uranium mining on his land. And the way he said it is this. You know, they own huge uh, acreage in northern Quebec. We don't own this land. We don't use this land. We are this land. So that notion of sacrifice, we become the problem, is the only way to approach it. One wrap-up slide. Wrap Is that okay? Great. I'll just cut through all. I'll cut through all this great stuff here. Just so the end. Just so that we say, the just because this is where it's all going. Um, the uh, the excavation movement of the radioactive contaminated soil is going to facilities at Port Granby and Port Hope, and this is going to turn those locales into mega projects of unearthed nuclear history, mound building, and forever nuclear visibility. With each truckload of soil, nuclear contamination will be exposed, heard, felt, and made visible in a process that will repeat 125,000 times. Thank you. Yes, right here, Jamie. Okay, um, question about Richard Dahl. Was that the Red Richard? Okay. Oh, curious if you have anything to say about the fact that um, sounds, and he was lauded as a epidemiologist, maybe, I don't know, until his death. You showed that uh, photograph of him getting an award in 2004, and um, which is curious to me, especially given that uh, you mentioned uh, sounded like he was a little weak on asbestos, dioxane, and uh, another uh, thing you mentioned. So, so what about this? He's been known to be soft on all these health risks, but then continuing to be lauded until maybe his, his death or recently. So if you have any comments about the social conditions making that uh, happen? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yes, good, uh, good, good question about Richard, Richard Dahl. Um, uh, I think what happened is that he was, um, he was asked, he was, he was identified, even having, even though he would stand up for a decade or two and say, you know, as a communist. Yeah, a young physician in in the 1930s. By by 56, he was identified by the establishment. I can imagine a meeting in the Athenaeum in which, after the, after Alice Stewart's the publication of her results, uh, he's identified as a kind of safe pair of hands. Uh, Khrushchev has made his speech. Wind scale is cranking up. It's the it's the birth of the the first big burst of uh, uh, the campaign for nuclear disarmament. It's a, I mean, her result is a serious threat to nuclearism. Uh, and and Dahl, of course, has been uh, working in, in social medicine. And he, um, I think he's asked to, um, to, destroy, to destroy the reputation. He spends the rest of his life uh, slighting uh, Alice Stewart. He becomes the Regis Professor of Medicine um, in, in Oxford. Uh, he makes sure that she gets no grants. Uh, even her, her, her survey, uh, her cancer survey, uh, uh, is, which she offers to Oxford when he, when he takes over, uh, he refuses it. That photograph, by the way, uh, Bob took that photograph, that great photograph of Alice standing by the, um, by, 
by, by the survey. Do Dahl, um, I mean, he's, it's interesting because he, he he's, he's, not a f he's, no, he's no fool, of course, and he, uh, he talks about the risk-benefit calculus. Um, and it's only after he's dead that we, it was exposed that he was taking so much money from industry. Uh, so in, in that sense, it's explained. When, when I said that it was interesting to me that he was a, a, a communist, there's all kinds of ways, of course, and this is the ironies of the, of the bomb, that it was a communist project. You know, so many of them were, were communists or fellow travelers. Frank Oppenheimer, who I mentioned, you know, for his great work in, you know, his bid for redemption through the Exploratorium. I mean, critical museology is massively in debt to, to J. Robert Oppenheimer's brother, Frank Oppenheimer. Those of you who've ever been to the Exploratorium in San Francisco know it's absolutely crucial in the history of interactive pedagogy and things uh, everywhere. And Frank's idea, Frank's bid for redemption was through a kind of open, open pedagogy and precisely to, to you know, refuse the, the, the secrecy and um, the fact that nobody knew that Dole was taking all this money from industry, it's, it, I mean, a, a lot of it just falls out simply on institutional grounds. You know, you you know why he's saying that because uh, if you did, if you if you knew that he was taking their money, um, but it was always available to make this cost-benefit calculus. But uh, the question's a great one, and this documentary, I hope, will lay out there, you know, the, the struggle between Stuart and Dahl. Okay, I'm just going to talk then. Um, my question is for Blake, or it's really a comment. Um, my family is actually from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, so I have a lot of nuclear in my past. But um, the, the photographs from the house of, um, what is it, Nidar? And you, you might know this, but there was a photograph of Donna Reed, which you didn't mention. And um, Donna Reed, uh, pushed for a movie about the Manhattan Project called The Beginning or the End that was produced by MGM in 1947, along with her science teacher, who had been a chemist at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So it seems that maybe all of those actors or actresses have some kind of nuclear connection. <clears throat> that's a really interesting, I didn't know that, and thanks for that. And that's, it's a really interesting connection. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I began to really uh, suspect that um, this was really a Madame Curie album. You know, uh, that at first I thought it was just one movie, because there are other movie stars in there, Lucille Ball, you know, um, uh, just, I don't know, just a number of these people um, uh, that, uh, that uh, have no connection at all to the Madame Curie. Curie movie, or, or no, 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 new, no known connection to radioactive issues per se. But then, um, then I did start to see that it was a kind of incestuous group in there, and they were all hot, somehow connected to the film Madame Curie, uh, but now even further than that. So it, it's interesting because on the one hand, it seems like a fairly innocent um, little album, but really, in a sense, it could well be his own idiosyncratic album of the nuclear era. And, and I think that's a really, that's something to go, that's actually something to look further into for me. So thank you. Ian has a footnote. Yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. Just a footnote to that. Um, Madame Curie's notebooks, uh, it turns out, are, are in, the, in the Welcome Library. Uh, you saw the photographs of the Petit Curie, the ambulances, uh, um, when she was in the First World War. Um, <clears throat> my partner, Gillian, is in charge, I say, of the conservation department there and has the problem of dealing with the notebooks. It's fascinating in terms of agnotology, the kind of the way in which we desperately need a kind of citizen science. It's very, it's, it's very unclear the, 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 uh, the mysteries of, of uh, uranium that that Robert was talking about. Um, it's, it's crucial to understand the difference between internal and external emitters. Uh, there's really very little danger from these notebooks, which were on, which were on her laptop, uh, her, her laboratory desktop. Um, 
The problem is that if you get you know, the, the, the friable nature of the cover, when that stuff comes off and you, in, you inhale it or ingest it, that's the big problem. Uh, we have to, you know, we really do need to understand the nature of the substance that we're talking about. And that's why it's, a, it's an episode in agnotology. I mean, this is constructed ignorance. It's shameful, and we need to change this. The coffee's here, so we'll take one last question or comment here, and then uh, depart through the center door. Hi, thank you so much. I, I wanted to especially thank uh, Blake and Robert for that wonderful presentation on Part Hope. And um, I wanted to just hear a bit more of, about not the work on Port Hope, but the work documenting um, uh, mining, uranium mining, and the photographic work of Diné miners that Robert did. And um, I'd just like to hear more about your thinking about that photographic work about um, what we might call like Canada's nuclear colonialism. So I'd love to just hear a little bit more about that work. Well, I, I can tell you that um, it was very difficult to get up to the Key Lake mine. I had to lie and say I was a radio reporter. And when I got up there, I said, oh, by the way, can, can I, I brought my camera. Can I take a few shots? Um, very difficult to get in. They, they protect their uh, tariff very much. But I also went to radio, Uranium City. I thought that would be a very interesting place to go to. And I went to Elliott Lake. As far as a, a concerted, uh, organized effort to, to really track this down, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of it's happening. It, it, it takes not only effort, but it takes a certain amount of funding. It would make a great grant project. I have this group called the Atomic Photographers Guild, and if we could get a grant to cover the impact on uh, native um, people and uranium, I mean, it's a great subject. I've also been to New Mexico and Arizona photographing, but, and I know several people who have also done it, but it's, it's, not, it's not organized. It's like a herd of cats with cameras going around doing what they can. But it, it, it should be a, it should be a consolidated project. That would be great. But nuclear culture is not uh, at that big funding level, as far as I know. Bob, thank you. Blake, thank you. I don't know whether this is turned on. Ian, thank you.